thank you and welcome. I'm excited to see such a great crowd this late on a Friday. Um, I know you're not just here for the food, right? <laughs> um, it is my great pleasure to introduce a uh, collaborator and dear friend, um, Fouad Hamidi. Fouad and I met at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, Fouad's now concluding his postdoc there. And before that, he received his PhD from York University. Um, and Fouad's work has been, he's a humble guy, he won't tell you this, but his work has been recognized by multiple uh, paper awards at conferences like CHI and Assets. Um, and one of the things I greatly admire about his work is that he um, does the, uh, he sets the example and lays the foundations for how to do participatory design with diverse user groups, um, like youth who are neuro neurodiverse. Um, and so thank you for that. And the other thing that I greatly admire about him is that for a brief period of time, he was the lead singer in a rock band, the name of which is too good for me to re reveal to you right now, so do ask him downstairs after or during the reception. Let's please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, can you hear me or should I use the, maybe I, oh, yeah. I think that might be better. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'm excited to share with you some of the work I've been doing in the past few years. Um, yeah, so as Stacy mentioned, uh, I'm currently uh, uh, just concluded my postdoc at, at uh, UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And uh, basically the main theme of my research is uh, participatory design of emerging technologies. And the idea is that how can we use this approach to increase inclusion uh, and empowerment uh, through technology development and design. So a little bit about the type of uh, methodologies uh, or approach that I use and some of the, my research experience. Uh, so I, a lot of my projects are involved working or going to the field and in the, uh, conducting uh, um, basically uh, projects in the field. So the general area is of course human computer interaction. So the question is, uh, around what happens when people and technology basically encounter each other. And um, I mentioned participatory design already. So this is an approach that was developed in the 60s and 70s in, um, in um, Scandinavia, in Northern Europe. Uh, but in the past few decades, it's been applied in a lot of different areas uh, of design uh, uh, for products, services, and environment uh, development or design, uh, including um, HCI. And um, I'm interested in this approach because it um, involves multiple stakeholders from the very beginning of the design uh, process. And uh, it has possibilities of creating uh, conversation and uh, diversifying conversations around design. Um, a lot of my work falls in the area of assistive technology and accessibility. Uh, so that's basically any technology that's designed for and with people with disabilities. Uh, but that's not the only area that I, I focus on. Um, also, I mostly use qualitative research methods, but for some projects, I use mixed methods, so sometimes a mix of quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, the research team, or generally the, the way that I choose what type of projects to work on, is basically uh, participatory design and evaluation of emerging technologies uh, to support the empowerment and inclusion of diverse populations. And uh, it's a kind of a um, dense uh, phrase, so I'm going to uh, break it down a little bit. Uh, what I mean by emerging technologies are technologies that have not become prevalent, but have the potential to become prevalent. And the reason that I'm interested in exploring and studying basically these type of technologies is that uh, I believe they have potential to impact people both in positive and negative ways. And if we don't um, study them and if we don't understand uh, their potential impacts, um, basically we might miss out on benefits that might come to diverse populations. Uh, and also there might be inadvertent um, or advertent um, negative impact. So that's the type of motivation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about empowerment and inclusion as I go into the projects, but I just wanted to kind of give an overview at the very beginning. So there's a number of different projects that I've been working on in the past few years. Um, obviously, I won't go into all of them. There's a, um, there's a number of them. I'm going to focus on uh, basically just the top three there. But I do want to mention uh, some of the other ones that I've been working on, and I'll be happy to uh, talk with you later uh, if, if any of them are uh, of interest, of a specific interest. Um, so just to mention the ones that I'm not going to um, 
going to today in the talk. Uh, I'm interested in uh, gender inclusive HCI, so there's actually a project um, that um, Stacey and I worked on together that looks at um, gender diversity and uh, basically its relationship to um, people's experiences in relation to emerging technologies. Uh, I'm also very interested in making and DIY approaches to learning and education for youth, especially underserved populations of youth. So that's another kind of area that I've been uh, active in. And also, I'm very interested in intercultural collaboration. So what happens when technology design kind of takes place in different cultural contexts, and how 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 does culture impact technology design? So. Um, the first project out of the three that I'm going to talk about today is about uh, DIY or do-it-yourself assistive technology. So I already mentioned the maker movement or DIY movement. In the past few decades, there's been some interest in terms of um, the possibilities of this approach to uh, technology design uh, with respect to learning and, um, and, and community engagement. So maker movement broadly is an umbrella term that refers to an international community of uh, designers, artists, crafts, people who are interested in craft, um, and, and also technologists who, who are mostly amateur and they are using emerging technologies to basically um, uh, engage in self-directed projects. Uh, there's different components to this movement, so there's um, basically events where people called maker fairs where people come and show uh, their projects together and there's maker spaces so these are spaces usually community run where um, people are engaged in making or using technology in these self-directed directed projects and then there's also a very um, large online presence both in terms of uh, communities and social networks but also uh, forums where people share their projects and give feedback to each other so some of the Technologies that are used widely and developed specifically for uh, the maker community include um, low-cost microcomputers and microcontrollers like the Raspberry Pi or, um, uh, or the Arduino microcontroller. You might have uh, used them or heard of them before. And these are basically, as an example, the Raspberry Pi is a credit card sized computer that's uh, very powerful and also very affordable. So it's about $35 and you can use it in a range of different physical computing uh, projects. And there's also um, relatively low cost uh, fabrication uh, process, uh, fabrication uh, platforms that are developed and used widely by the maker community. For, for example, 3D printing or laser cutting is, uh, is some, of, some examples of that. So from my perspective, I was very interested to see what are the possibilities of this approach to technology design um, for people with diverse abilities. And Basically, the question I, um, I am interested in is how can DIY approaches um, support the creation of assistive technologies uh, for diverse users? And of course, there's many different types of assistive technologies. There's already several initiatives within the maker community that look at building switches or building um, uh, prosthetics. Uh, I was specifically interested in um, augmentative and alternative communication technology. So in this picture um, on the on the right, there's a there's a person who's sitting in a wheelchair. They have a cerebral palsy, and uh, basically they're nonverbal, so they have uh, no speech or very limited speech. And they're using a, a device. It's, uh, it's a, a communication board, and basically there's a series of uh, buttons on this device. And when they're pressed, an audio clip uh, that corresponds to that button is going to play out. And basically they use this as a formal alternative communication for others. So the picture on the left shows a number of commercial products that uh, actually implement this type of technology and they've been around for a long time. Basically there's a lot of uh, options on the market um, for this type of technology. However, the issue is that sometimes these devices can be very expensive and also while the software has some flexibility in terms of uh, being able to change it or customize it, the physical components of the, uh, of the boards and of the other AAC devices are very hard to uh, customize and change. So this can cause some barriers to access for um, different users that could potentially benefit from alternative forms of communication, but they can't use the existing solutions. 
So I was very interested in this space because um, I've done some work previously also for my PhD in the, um, 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 I mean the um, speech language pathology space, and I was familiar with this question. So while going to some of the maker events that I was mentioning before, so uh, uh, Maker Fair in Toronto specifically, I met um, Mr. Ray Faraday, he has a picture, he's in the picture here. He's an um, uh, experienced uh, special education teacher from Toronto with many years of experience working with um, basically students with uh, diverse abilities and with communication difficulties. And also he's a maker, so in this picture you see him uh, prototyping a device that he's trying to build for one of his students. And the idea I wanted to have a conversation, and I got very excited about this possibility, was that he was using a Makey Makey, which is another kind of popular uh, board that people use in the maker uh, community, uh, to build a device that was usable by one of his students who had difficulty using existing commercial devices. And uh, but he he's not he didn't have uh, programming experience, and he had a lot of difficulty actually getting the device to do some of the things that he wanted to do. So of course it was a good match because. Um, my background is in computer science and also at our school there were several students who were interested in programming. So we got together and we uh, basically uh, implemented the idea that he had. So we co-designed this device that we call a talk box and it's a do-it-yourself uh, communication board for nonverbal users. So in the picture there's a girl with cerebral palsy who's sitting at a wheelchair and on the wheelchair tray there's uh, one of these devices and uh, basically it consists of a board with a series of buttons that you can press and uh, basically it can play back the audio. Um, in her case, she had difficulty with the existing devices because she has very limited hand um, movement in her hand and so she couldn't press, a, she can't press a button. Um, so we had to decrease the, or increase the sensitivity of the touch sensor and so when, even when her hand was close to the, uh, to the pad you see there, it was able to play back the audio file. So, uh, she basically was able to use this device. Of course, this device is not meant to be used for a very long time by a user because as you can see, the number of choices there are very small. Uh, there's just six choices, um, but it can be increased and also it can be customized. Um, but more importantly, it is a bridging device. So basically the idea is that for somebody who's waiting to get a more sophisticated system or who has to learn how to use a much simpler system in order to use a more sophisticated system, it can be used in, in that time to basically teach some uh, skills that are needed for using future systems. So I have a video here that shows the device in action. with two users that were shown in this video. One was the girl that you saw earlier in the image and she was sitting on a wheelchair. And the other one is actually a, a boy with autism who can uh, take the device and walk and go to different rooms in, her, in his school. Uh, but still he has difficulty with communication, he's nonverbal. And, and the device in that case was customized to be used as, uh, as a, a way to exercise greetings and basically complete um, uh, basic communication tasks. So there was some uh, customization there. 
But the point of this device, because I mentioned a DIY system, uh, technology, is not that we have a final product. The idea is that it should be something that can be uh, built and customized by users or their community themselves. And so once we knew that, okay, this is something that's useful and there are a few use cases that we could uh, see in the, in the uh, students that Ray was working with, uh, we basically deconstructed the, uh, the device into a kit. And the idea was that if you have uh, the components and a set of instructions, then perhaps our users can build the device themselves. And we were interested to see what happens when uh, users or their parents or um, non-technical -te uh, adults who work with them, once they build and customize their own technology, would, what kind of impact would it have on their, um, on their basically understanding or on their self sense of self-efficacy with respect to this type of technology uh, modification? So in another Make Affair, so another, the next Make Affair basically I went to, uh, we ran a workshop and we invited families who had children uh, or also uh, teenager or adults who, who were nonverbal to come and participate in small teams with volunteers and um, with some of the uh, students that we were working with to basically build these devices themselves. We were curious to see, first of all, uh, are our instructions going to work um, and are they adequate to, uh, are, and enough to build one of these devices, and also what type of impact would it have on the, on the users. So the workshops um, basically uh, were, were able to achieve the outcome of building these devices. So there were six devices that were built. And uh, following up, we uh, found that the children continued to use these devices after some time. Um, this was a pilot, so we don't have yet know exactly what type of impact would it have on their self-efficacy or their attitudes towards the technology, but that's the next step. So, so far we know that uh, there's interest in the community towards this device uh, or towards this type of technology, and there's variations actually of TalkBox that emerge. So there's a couple of pictures on the bottom here that uh, show some variations of TalkBox and their smaller versions of the system. So. Um, Basically, there's only two choices here, and but they were basic, they were uh, customized based on the needs of um, of another child who was working with a speech language pathologist, and uh, basically, the speech language pathologist wanted to have a very small number of choices because uh, the child would get overwhelmed if there were more than a couple of choices there. So there are it is possible to kind of have some variations of this uh, device built by end users. Because of the low cost of the device, so this whole um, system costs less than $100, maybe more, closer to $80, and there was a lot of interest in some other communities that we actually had not explored before in the device. So actually, we got some interest in Western Kenya to, uh, to basically experiment with this device as a way of uh, technology that can be built and assembled there uh, for some of the special education classes that they have. So, we ran a series of workshops in, in Kenya uh, that where we brought some of these uh, devices there and actually as kids and basically we worked with the local university there uh, in, in, uh, in Maseno, Maseno University in uh, Kisumu which is the third largest city in, in Kenya to basically build and uh, evaluate some of these devices. But more importantly we use this device as a way of talking about the possibilities of uh, DIY assistive technology in this context. So we ran also a series of focus groups with um, participants who came from or, uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations and also community members and nonprofits who were active in that area and they provide educational or um, therapeutic services to the community. Uh, one of the reasons that we were interested in Kenya is that uh, in recent years there's been a lot of interest in developing technologies and digital technologies in Kenya that are kind of homegrown there and can be used in sub-Saharan Africa. And also uh, there's legislation there that really uh, tries to support uh, uh, access to education for people with disabilities. So there is a growing interest in this region around how um, new forms of assistive technologies that can be customized and built there um, can be used uh, in that context. And we saw some interesting results when we were running the experiments in, um, or the study in, in Kenya. Uh, one was that um, the form of the device was 
changed and, uh, uh, and and there was a lot of interest to use some local materials uh, in the in the design of the system. So this is one version. It's a prototype that was built with uh, with wood actually. So uh, while uh, in, in uh, Canada and in uh, the United States we were using other material as the chassis of the device. In Kenya they were interested in using some of the uh, material that was easier to find and customize there. And also another thing that we found was that the teachers used the device in a completely different way in Kenya. So while in the United States and, and Canada uh, the idea, the model was that each person would get um, or each child would get one of these devices. In, in, in Kenya uh, the, the device was shared among basically all the students in the classroom. Uh, there were several reasons for this, but one big part of it was that this, the, the way that a lot of the technology are used in the school in Kenya is that it is shared, and the idea is that the device would be more valuable uh, as a tool for including uh, students in classroom activities and keeping them engaged rather than um, using for individual communication. So there was ways that the technology was basically appropriated in a different way in, in that context. So we're planning to also explore a very big question in this space, which is sustainability. So what would happen if uh, the interest there is going to lead to maybe this device being used as a product that can actually be assembled and fixed and um, basically built there. And, uh, but it's a very big uh, question. And we're basically talking to a lot of stakeholders, again, uh, governmental and non-governmental agencies and, um, and organizations to, to see if there are uh, ways to make this possible. Another variation of this system that is, uh, or this approach that's uh, emerged since we started kind of working on this project is that uh, when the, as you saw in the previous slides, Talkbox has a series of, or a set of, um, of buttons. And the buttons are attached to the device. And we thought what would happen if these buttons are actually distributed in an in a environment, in a space. Um, so what, what about if we have buttons that are actually objects and by bringing them close to the device you can play back the audio as opposed to, uh, to touching, the, uh, touching the device. And this idea came from uh, some of the speech language pathologists that they work with and uh, for example in the picture on the top there, it's a, a, one of the speech language pathologists was showing us uh, some objects that she uses um, in her practice to teach some of the, her clients uh, the name of um, uh, common objects or uh, different kind of speech patterns. Um, so using this type of physical object is common in, in speech language pathology. And uh, one of the uh, functionalities that the uh, speech language pathologist wanted to have was that what if these objects could be uh, used as audio triggers. Uh, also, in music therapy, it's common to use physical objects, I mean, typically instruments, but also drums or shakers, uh, to include client in music making activity. So that was another possible use of a device that can play back uh, audio in response to uh, physical objects in this space. So having those ideas, we went back to the um, kind of the drawing board and started prototyping and making another version of Talkbox that um, we actually uh, called it SenseBox. And this system, what it does is that it, um, it is also a physical computing platform, but instead of being in the form of a board, it's in the form of um, an object that can play back audio. So, the picture on the left shows some prototypes of this that we built and we brought to speech language pathologists and they basically evaluated them with, the, um, with, the, with some of their clients. And then eventually we um, narrowed down on the, uh, on the design that you see on the, on the right there. So there's a picture of the system here. Um, I'm not a big fan of Bruno Mars, um, <laughs> but one of the clients that we were working with, uh, uh, he really liked him obsessively, and he kept going on YouTube and kind of trying to find his videos, and it seemed to, I mean, the therapist told us, it kept going to uh, inappropriate places, and so they wanted a way for him to be able to play back his favorite songs, and uh, that 
so that he could um, exercise his agency and make choices about the songs that he likes uh, without the distraction of a screen and without the distraction of a whole uh, network behind it. So in this case, uh, we basically have a number of um, RFID tags that are embedded into CD cases. Um, so in case you thought CD cases are uh, a thing of the past, they can still be reused. But basically, the CD case is the perfect size because if you can put a picture of the artist that kind of corresponds to a favorite song by this child, and then they can basically uh, play back the song by bringing the CD case or the augmented CD case close to the playback module. So that was kind of one idea. Uh, but I think of this system as, uh, and also the TalkBox system, as a prototyping platform. So if you think of the Raspberry Pi that I showed at the beginning, it's very powerful and it has a very friendly name, but actually you have to kind of be a computer scientist to be able to get it up and running. Like if you give it to a, a parent or, a, or somebody who hasn't programmed before, they might have a lot of difficulty using it to build something that their child can use. But the idea is that how can we add a layer of accessibility to these type of very powerful, very affordable, but hard to use technologies so that people can use them to prototype um, and build their own customized experiences. So this is a very new project and um, uh, we're going to kind of continue uh, exploring to see what type of ideas it can, um, people can use it to come up with basically. Okay, so I'm going to continue on the theme of um, uh, speech language therapy and therapy in general. Uh, but uh, for the next project, I'm going to talk about a project that I basically spent a long time uh, doing my PhD working on. And in this, uh, in this case, uh, the space is speech language, uh, speech language um, therapy. So the, I, the space where um, there's um, basically a series of procedures and exercises to, uh, to help and improve uh, language um, language expression. But the question was different, and the question in this case was that how can we design a system to motivate children with communication disorders uh, to complete therapeutic exercises in the home setting? So in this case we're talking more about motivation, and the idea was that how can you motivate uh, children to uh, do some exercises and also do them in the absence of adults. Um, so I started this project as a PhD student, and I think I underestimated the difficulty of designing for children. Mm -hmm. If you design for children, they're very honest, but also they can be really brutal. So the, the prototyping this, uh, process uh, in this case took a very long time. I built a number of projects that were happily destroyed by the children, uh, but I also learned a lot. And also I, I kind of, so there's some pictures there of things that, uh, that were built and brought to the homes. And the idea behind um, this project is that how can we build a physical system, an ambient system that can exist in the uh, environment in which the children are uh, very familiar with, uh, and it can also be a motivating system um, because we want it to basically sustain their interest over time. Um, as I was kind of working on this project, um, again, motivation was a big difficult issue. Um, I wasn't sure how to keep the children motivated. I experimented with some games. I experimented with some um, other kind of graphical stories and so on. And the thing is that they were effective in the very short term, uh, but after a short time, the children kind of lost interest. So a team that kind of came up again and again with the families I was working with, and, and I mean, as part of participatory design, I was uh, trying to embed myself, to, I mean not really embed myself in a family home because that would be a little <laughs> bit strange, uh, but, but kind of embed, uh, uh, familiarize myself with some, the things that were exciting to the children that I was um, working with. And, and one of the themes that kept coming up was life. So there was a lot of pets that children had, there was a lot of plants that some of them had, and, and so on. And uh, actually some of the children kept talking about these pets or animals that they were really kind of excited about. So after a while, I kind of started thinking also about this um, possibility of somehow incorporating a living mechanism or organism into an interface. And the, the thing is, uh, you might have um, used or seen a Tamagotchi or Aibo, you might have heard of these things. So these are technologies that have been, especially the uh, uh, Tamagotchi has been around for a long time. So it's a digital system that simulates a living um, being, I guess. So it's a pet. It's a virtual pet, basically. And there's a large number of them. Um, so th that approach exists. 
Uh, there is some research that shows that having virtual pets and kind of simulating life can be confusing for young children. Uh, specifically, Sherry Turkle has done some work at MIT that kind of looks into this. Uh, but there's also uh, issues around, um, uh, I mean, artificial life and how to design that kind of behavior to be engaging over time. Instead, I thought, well, why, why should we simulate life? Maybe there's a way of actually incorporating something that's alive into this interface. And basically, after a long time of thinking, I came up with a system called Rafi um, in Farsi, Arabic, and I think Turkish. Uh, the term means uh, companion. And basically, it's a system that uses a living um, edible, actually, once you cook them. Uh, oyster <laughs> mushrooms in the design of, uh, in the, in the in as part of the interface of an ambient uh, display, basically. And it's designed for use in home and school setting uh, for children, for children with communication disorders. And um, yeah, so the idea is that we want to use and the, basically the, the, the growth um, changes in the mushroom to keep the children interested in some activity that they're doing. So you can think of it as a data visualization mechanism uh, or maybe data mushroomization <laughs> mechanism, but basically it's using the living, the changes in the living organism to show, to communicate some information to the children. Um, Inside the system, there's a, a living um, organism is housed in a, in a growing medium. So this is uh, mostly ground, used coffee grounds and some other materials. And then there's a mini uh, irrigation system. And uh, that's controlled by, initially it was an Arduino, but later um, I, I used the Raspberry Pi. So basically there's a microcomputer in there that uh, can basically receive uh, uh, some information in terms of the amount of time that something has been, uh, an app, let's say, has been used, and then it can um, administer water to the mushroom that, uh, that connects to that. So the algorithm for running this system is actually very simple. Uh, there are a large number, actually, of apps out there that are designed to support uh, communication, so, uh, and these apps can be used to train a, a different uh, types of skills. So, for example, for emotion recognition or for uh, vocabulary acquisition, or some of them are for speech recognition or for speech uh, practice. Uh, but the idea was that if there is a number of these apps that are desired to be used by the children, how can we encourage them um, by, uh, by connecting the amount of time that they spend on using these apps to the growth of the mushroom. And so I spend a lot of time in the lab looking at what happens when different amounts of water are given to the mushroom. And I was able to come up with a, a mechanism that basically corresponded the amount of, uh, amount of water to the growth of the mushroom. So this system uh, essentially implements a very slow ambient display. Um, it takes about uh, about 20 days, uh, about almost a little bit less than three weeks for the mushrooms to start from nothing to a full-grown mushroom, and and basically after that you have to uh, harvest them. Uh, but the idea was that this growth can uh, motivate children to keep using these apps over time. So this is a big question I always get um, from the time I started this project: Why mushrooms? There's a lot of different mechanisms that might be in this space. Uh, the first reason, of course, is safety. So these uh, mushrooms were meant to be left with the children over extended periods of time. So they definitely had to be safe. And when you're working with living organic material, um, finding safe um, material is actually can be a little bit challenging. So this was one uh, important factor. And the mushrooms that I used were uh, specifically designed for use in school and houses to grow, uh, to grow for uh, families. So they were uh, thoroughly tested before I incorporated them into this interface. Uh, the other factor was that uh, the system was predictable. I mean, to some extent, it's not a digital system, so I couldn't really control the mushrooms the way you can control the pixels in an image. Uh, but uh, through some experimentation in the lab, I could correlate the amount of water that's given to the mushroom to the growth um, uh, in terms of growth rate um, in, the, in the lab. So that's another factor. Uh, the third piece was that the changes should be perceivable uh, by children. So 
I mean, a tree could be also potentially safe and also uh, can be predictable to some extent, but it takes months or years for the changes to happen, and of course, uh, uh, it would be difficult to keep the ch children interested in it. Uh, so, um, the mushrooms, because they take hours to, for the changes to show up, my hypothesis was that uh, the children, or most of the children, would not lose interest in the mushrooms very quickly. So, so those were some of the reasons. And of course, we had to verify that. So we ran a series of um, case studies uh, that were conducted in the wild, let's say, uh, meaning that in the home or school setting, uh, so in the naturalistic setting that the system was designed to be um, evaluated. And, um, and we found that actually the, having the system, the physical system, in the homes uh, led to interesting dynamics. So some of the dynamics included increase in using the apps, which we had predicted to some extent, uh, but also a lot of spontaneous conversations between parents and children. Uh, one of the concerns that we had was that the relationship between these apps and the mushrooms might be a little bit complicated and hard for the children to grasp. Um, however, that kind of um, weakness actually led to a lot of conversations where the children were asking parents about how this all works, what does it mean for the mushrooms to grow, what does it mean for my actions to um, have those type of consequences, not in those words obviously, in children's words, but it led to a lot of uh, conversations. And this was a desired outcome because uh, in most of the uh, case studies that we were doing, we were working with children who, uh, who had autism or who had other communication disorders that really uh, limited or decreased their, um, their communication with their peers and, and with their parents. So that increase in communication was something that was uh, very well desired. And one of the challenges of this project was to know how much of this impact was due to the novelty of the mushrooms versus to actually dynamics of, let's say, caring or responsibility towards them. Um, however, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a hard uh, problem to, to crack because you have to have a longer term uh, study, but that would be something very interesting to look at in the future. So this project, um, falls into a kind of a broader space where, um, where, which can be characterized as the space of living media interfaces. So these are interfaces that somehow uh, incorporate living organisms and uh, digital systems. And there's actually a range of different uh, uh, projects that work on systems like this. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this space is the ethical question. So uh, when is it okay to use uh, living media in this way and uh, uh, incorporate organisms for our benefit into the, into the design of uh, objects? And when is it not ethical? So that's kind of one direction. Another direction is the, the idea of time and what does it mean to have time in a virtual space versus a, uh, an organic uh, dimension. So there's definitely a lot of open questions in this space. Okay, so so far I've been mostly talking about some potential benefits that this type of emerging technology, so the living media interfaces and the uh, do-it-yourself uh, assistive technologies can, uh, can bring about. Uh, in the last project, I want to talk a little bit about um, some inadvertent, uh, uh, I mean, uh, negative or harm uh, that can actually come by with emerging technologies. So the, the topic for this uh, project was looking at the privacy trade-offs of intelligent systems. And by intelligent, I meant uh, systems that uh, collect user data and basically uh, adapt their behavior so that they can uh, respond more effectively to uh, user uh, behavior. In the space of assistive technology, an example of this technology would be uh, something that is an adaptive assistive technology. So it's a system that can uh, collect user data and change its uh, behavior or its functionality so that it can benefit or it can better match the abilities of the user. Uh, of course, uh, in the space of disability, uh, people have a, uh, diverse abilities and also sometimes those abilities can be dynamic and can change. So having a system that can be responsive in that way uh, can uh, provide usability gains. However, the issue is that whenever you collect data, there's the, there's the danger of what happens if this data is, sh is used or is accessed by people who are not supposed to have it. So we wanted to understand um, what are some of these trade-offs here. 
And as an example of this type of technology for people who have um, essential tremors or Parkinson's and de therefore difficulty uh, with um, motor, uh, flying motor movement in their hands, uh, sometimes clicking um, links can be difficult. Uh, on a web page. So uh, we developed this system that basically is a bubble cursor. So bubble cursor is a cursor that increases size um, and it makes it easier to select links. And the, it's a dynamic one. So basically it looks at the uh, rate of missed uh, clicks or missed targets and it increases its size um, uh, in response to that. So this system can potentially benefit, uh, benefit users but we kind of came up with an issue because when we wanted to test it, we realized that if we install it in somebody's home, we, we actually have, it's pretty easy to, if you have it as an extension, let's say, as a browser extension, to collect a lot of data, including where uh, people are visiting, what, which websites they're going to, what type of errors they have, and so on. And so we were kind of concerned about uh, what are some of the privacy threats that can be, um, that users can be exposed by. Um, using such technologies. But of course, um, talking about privacy can be a little bit difficult. So our idea was that how can we talk to our participants, maybe we can uh, conduct interviews and see what type of uh, concerns they have about uh, privacy if they're using such a system. Um, but we had to first come up with a way to talk about privacy in a way that's understandable to diverse users because we were working with uh, older adults basically in this space. So we came up with a, a participatory, uh, low-tech, visual, tactile activity set. Uh, initially, the idea was that it could be a privacy game, uh, but we decided not to use the term game, but it was more of an activity that um, our participants were using. And uh, the activity basically asked them to categorize um, uh, third parties based on what their concern was, if their data was uh, shared. So the tactile part of it was important because in the interview we wanted our participants to be able to uh, pick objects and move them around and uh, we were interested to see whether having this type of um, interview would impact their um, the type of feedback that they would give us. So we conducted two sets of interviews, one without these uh, tools, let's say, or uh, these cards, and one with the cards later on. And we actually found that the, using these cards allowed uh, our participants or basically uh, created the possibility of eliciting very detailed um, uh, feedback from them about the type of um, data that they were thinking that the system can collect and how they felt about uh, this data being shared with third parties. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but actually um, one of the uh, surprising uh, findings was that uh, the use our, our participants who had uh, essential tremors, they were actually uh, happy with sharing their data within the context of that program because they believed that sharing their data might lead to gains for their community. So in the wider, like if everybody who has essential tremors is going to use that application, uh, it, it would be desirable for the users to share their data because then it can benefit everybody. On the other hand, they were also concerned about this data being used outside of the context and outside of the premise that, uh, that it was initially collected. So instead of being used by, um, the, let's say, the company or the organization that developed the app to, uh, to improve um, its, its usability for a wide range of people if it's sold to, let's say, insurance companies or, or third parties. So this table here kind of shows some of the preferences that uh, the participants had. And initially, there was a lot of preferences for sharing the data uh, for with family members, medical professionals, or the company that developed this, um, this uh, application. Uh, but people did not want their data to be shared with insurance companies, employers, and, and governments. And one thing that we found was that these preferences also shift over time. So we ran a series of interviews and in, over time it, it seems like um, some of the, uh, the interviews actually led to a lot of reflection about um, what type of preferences um, uh, our participants had. So in a lot of cases, the, after thinking about it, they actually wanted less uh, third parties to have access to their data. Uh, but in some cases, some of them actually changed their mind and they were okay with their data being shared uh, with, let's say, the, some government agency that would then use it to improve access for more people. Okay, so 
To wrap up, um, I hope that with these projects of um, kind of demonstrated some uh, questions that are of interest in terms of what would be some possibilities of emerging technologies to benefit diverse um, users, and also have uh, also shown an example of uh, what might be some of the um, adverse effects that are possible if we basically develop and deploy these technologies without considering uh, things like privacy and so on. So. Um, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your interest, and um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions or comments. Questions? Um, so thank you. This is, this is really interesting stuff. I wanted to ask a little bit about the um, I'm fascinated by the sort of the temporalities at work in the in the mushroom project. And you, you so you spoke about the problems of having um, something that that is going to respond fast enough, essentially, that the children can be aware of the consequences of their actions. But I'm actually really intrigued to just think about it as actually also being slow enough as to promote particular kinds of kinds of engagement. So so did did were you also thinking about what an adequate pace for that interaction is and how to actually find something not that's fast enough, but that's slow enough? Yes, yes, I think that's a really good question. Um, actually, that time is a very big component of that project because uh, I think in contrast to a lot of existing applications or let's say toys that are built for children, uh, their response is very quick. So you press a button, something happens. Also, you can play around with time, so applications sometimes can go backwards in a story or a narrative or forwards. None of these exist with the mushrooms, obviously, in a very natural way. Um, the, the issue was time was that what we found, um, some of the children, uh, the pacing was seemed like very effective for them. So they were actually engaged with the slow pace of the changes. Um, uh, so it was slow enough for them. And actually, if they were engaged over, let's say, two or three days, they would stay engaged until the end. And that engagement would become more and more and more. Um, however, there were a few children in our cases where they were interested in the beginning, but they started losing interest. And I think that time kind of had some effect on that. There were other factors too, but it seemed like that was a little bit too slow for them. Uh, one of the difficulties with that type of result is that it's really hard to know what is the right, because slow enough is in relation to individual um, people. And some, ch some of the children, it was slow or fast enough for them. It was the right pace, let's say, or effective pace. Uh, but for some of them, it, it was not. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that when I was uh, working with the mushrooms, uh, there's definitely a lot of constraints about how what I could do as uh, a designer or as a researcher in relation to this, um, to this design. Because one of the things I found was that at the very beginning, the mushrooms take a long time to show any visibility. And that was a big problem because I would bring this to the house and in the first couple of case studies, the children were excited. They kept looking at it, nothing was happening. Not even for a day, it's too long. Mm -hmm. uh, and once the things were started, they had kind of, it had a dampening effect. So what I did was that I would start uh, uh, growing the mushrooms at home, and as soon as they were, or in the lab, and as soon as they were starting, I would bring it to the, so, uh, so it, there was some ways of dealing with the time constraints, but it definitely has its own kind of constraints because it's a living media as opposed to a digital media. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I have one. Yes. Um, so a dear friend of mine, uh, Meg Kurzilek, who worked under Deborah Tater, did her dissertation studying um, uh, technology that was widely adopted in, in Texas that was supposed to help middle schoolers learn about um, algebra, okay? And the thing about this is that on the whole it was a massive success, um, but in particular classrooms it was either extremely effective or extremely ineffective. And her explanation for this was that teachers had a sort of resource use with itness, is what she called it, but basically had this intuition about how to integrate technology into the classroom so as to achieve a certain level of control over the students or, um, 
or role modeling by certain students as opposed to others. And um, I was curious when you talked about how um, some teachers were taking these AAC devices and using it differently in their classrooms about what the, um, what educational effects that that might have had or other sorts of impacts about student relationships with each other versus the relationship to the front of the classroom? Yeah, um, actually that's also a very good question because it talks to the power dynamics to some extent. Um, yeah, it's a little early days for that project mm -hmm. to be able to draw a lot of uh, mm -hmm. yeah concrete, um, mm -hmm. I mean, ideas around how what is the impact of having that technology, let's say in a classroom, and mm -hmm. how does it how does it basically uh, empower or disempower mm -hmm. um, certain both the teachers or the students or mm -hmm. certain groups of the students in the classroom. But one of the things we found uh, was that in Kenya, the teachers um, were very very like seriously they were. Um, um, uh, pushing the idea that all the children in the classroom should be able to somehow use this device. Mm. And it, it came down to some, some of the children, because it's a, the, the setting that we were using the device was very different mm -hmm. in the sense that um, mm -hmm. most of the children, I mean it was a special education, a, like a large special education mm -hmm. classroom. So I would say maybe about 20 students with different disabilities and different levels of uh, abilities. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very challenging dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet the, the, child, the teacher would take a long time kind of trying to do something with each child with the device that ah. would kind of engage them. <laughs> Yeah, another thing that we saw there that might be related to uh, what you were mentioning was that uh, they, they use the device in a completely different way by recording the name of all the children mm -hmm. and then having it play back that name. Mm -hmm. So it was something that we hadn't thought about, but it was about kind of go giving back to the children something that the device could recognize them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't want to draw any conclusions about the, let's say the cultural meanings of that or significance of that, but there was a lot of talk about stigma and kind of including children in a way mm -hmm. that kind of empowers them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I don't know if this device is something that can do mm -hmm. that, but some of the practices seem to be kind of coming from that mm -hmm. perspective. Yeah. Thank you, interesting. Yeah. Other questions? You had touched on it a little bit, but um, I'm interested just to hear a little bit more about like kind of the ethical, um, Conversation that's going around with interactive, or interactive, uh, alive interfaces. Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. So uh, there's several teams. Um, a lot of that com conversation has come from. Uh, there's a community animal computer interaction. There's actually a series of conferences. So there's been uh, some very strong voices within that community that advocate for participatory design with non-human animals. And, which is kind of an interesting concept, but at the same time, there's a lot of criticism of that concept because there's anthropomorphism, there's this idea that we are kind of uh, reflecting our own values into non-human non animals and also other uh, living organisms and so on. So there's, that's one kind of dominant conversation that's going on. Uh, but also, I mean, one conversation that's been uh, very active in, in, not necessarily in human computer interaction, but uh, coming coming from biology um, is what is what are the ethical limits of of let's say using these type of organisms for what purposes? Um, so there are some lines that are drawn, and there are some uh, bioethicists that have very strong um, I mean arguments for either using or not using this, uh, or what type of uses are uh, let's say allowed or ethical versus uh, non-ethical. Uh, but yeah, that's something that clearly kind of translates into our space. Um, another point about this, and I've been kind of thinking about this a lot recently, is that, um, I mean, humans are also animals. We tend to forget that. But um, if you think about it that way, you can think of all technology as a living media interface. So we are also, our relationship with technology is really impacted by how, where we put the center of, let's say, who's the user. Um, but I mean, it's kind of, it, it really helps kind of blur some of those boundaries, especially when it comes to people talking about um, cyborg identity or identities that kind of try to play around with that very, I think, solidified human identity. I don't know if that's. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of 
trying to make a dis, uh, uh, to make two constructs in your presentation connecting to each other. You mentioned earlier um, there were a lot of use of physical objects as a sound trigger, but the mushroom doesn't have a sound. And I wonder, um, connecting the point uh, earlier about temporality, yeah. if you can play around with like giving the mushroom a voice, hmm. so that yeah. makes the quote a lot more visible, given that there's constraint on time. Do you want? Do you have um, any ideas like what you want to do with the mushroom, taking a step further? Um, I really like that idea. Uh, so John Cage, um, uh, who worked a lot with. Um, uh, music that was kind of accidental music and found objects. He was also a mushroom um, enthusiast, actually semi-professional. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, sorry, this, sound, this might sound a bit random, but it's kind of connected. Um, so once I learned that um, kind of a strange factoid, I was very interested in implementing a version of this system uh, or this design in which the mushroom's um, uh, physical appearance can be translated, can be detected by, let's say, um, a very uh, um, strong camera because it has to be able to detect those very small movements and translate it into a sort of soundtrack. Um, I wasn't able to pull it off because my musical and my, um, I mean, computer vision roots are not strong. But I think in theory, that could be an interesting way um, of, first of all, kind of add some other layer of expression, let's say, uh, to that object, um, but also I think embedding that sound, which is not something I thought before, but the way that you mentioned it, uh, in the device might actually engage some of the other children maybe who were not just engaged by the visual mm -hmm. appearance or the physical existence of the object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, and with that, I think we're out of time, and I'd like to invite all of you to join our speaker downstairs for the social hour. Let's please thank our speaker.